there were some very tough choices to be made. And I decided to speak mostly or almost exclusively about um, experiments which we know firsthand because we have had uh, uh, experience collaborating with them in the, developing in the development of the White Rabbit uh, synchronization technology. So um, as some of you know, we started developing White Rabbit a few years ago uh, with the aim of coming up with the next generation timing system for the particle accelerators at CERN. But from the beginning, we wanted to make it open source, hardware, gateware, software, and we wanted to make it based on standards and enhance st the standards when need be. And also we wanted it to be a collaboration with institutes, companies, etc. So we were very lucky to be joined quite early on by a number of very brilliant people trying to solve uh, many different problems in physics. So what I did to prepare this presentation is to ask my friends in the White Rabbit community to send me material I could show to illustrate what are the physics challenge, challenges that they're trying to tackle. Uh, since White Rabbit is open source, many of the users are also developers. So they also contributed uh, to improving White Rabbit because they exposed it to many different environments and they uncover shortcomings and they fix them. So I want to start by thanking them uh, thanking the White Rabbit community for all these contributions, for all the fun we're having together. And in particular, I also want to thank the, uh, the White Rabbit team at CERN, uh, which originally developed the first version of White Rabbit and who are still going on very strong. Um, so I'm going to give you a very quick uh, statement of the state of physics and uh, some of the challenges today to provide context for the, uh, the uh, uh, continuation of the talk. Uh, in terms of matter, uh, this is our current knowledge. I will focus on the uh, first uh, generation of particles which make up all the matter. So leptons and quarks, <coughs> uh, the atom is made of a nucleus with orbit, uh, electrons orbiting around, neutrons and protons in the nucleus are made of quarks up and down. And this is the first generation of particles here. There's also the electron neutrino, which is a very mysterious particle I will say some words about later as well. And then there are two additional generations which are like heavier cousins of the first generation. Plus, of course, every particle has an antiparticle uh, which comes with its own set of unsolved mysteries. But that's only a tiny part of the uh, matter and energy content out there, 5%. The rest is dark matter and dark energy. So dark matter is something that physicists uh, need to postulate to explain uh, the rotation speed of some galaxies, for example. So if you look at a galaxy and you take all the luminous objects from that galaxy and put them in a model and apply Newton's laws and make it rotate, you will see what you have in the right-hand side of this picture. But in fact, the galaxy rotates faster. And in order to make it rotate faster, you need to uh, artificially add matter, which is in shaded pink, in this video, in this uh, uh, animation, and that matter that you have to add, which we don't see because it doesn't shine any light, uh, is what's called dark matter. So uh, people are clueless so far as to the nature of dark matter. I will say, I think you heard yesterday other methods of looking for dark mar matter. I will tell you about more traditional ways that are also going on. And then you have dark energy, <coughs> which is what physicists postulate to uh, account for the anomalous acceleration of the expansion of the universe. So uh, as you all know, there's this Big Bang Theory that says that there was an explosion, the universe expands, but then after 7.5 billion years, there is uh, an acceleration of that expansion rate, which is uh, not very well explained. So uh, physicists postulate the existence of a, something called dark energy, which is repulsive in nature, and would explain this anomalous expansion rate. Okay, as I told you, White Rabbit was developed in the context of uh, particle accelerators at CERN. We wanted to develop a new timing system. So let me tell you some words about how particle accelerators work. Uh, this is a synchrotron, the LHC, the biggest accelerator at CERN is a synchrotron. And the way it works is the following. You have radio frequency cavities in orange here, which are mechanical structures. And in them, there is a resonating, so there are resonating cavities. There is a standing, a standing wave, a standing field. And if you arrange for particles to arrive at the radio frequency cavities at a moment, which is during the positive half cycle of the sine wave, then they get a kick every time they cross these cavities. And that's the way you accelerate. 
And of course, you have to be careful because particles do have a tendency to go straight in a straight line. So you have to bend their trajectory. And uh, in order to uh, constrain their trajectory to stay in the beam pipe, which is roughly circular, we use electromagnets. And the, uh, these electromagnets with a vertical magnetic field, they have to ramp up in power at the same time as the acceleration happens in the accelerating cavity, hence the name uh, synchrotron. So then in four points uh, in the LHC, particles are made to collide and physicists look at the uh, products of those collisions. And that's how they found the Higgs boson uh, a few years ago. This is a depiction of ATLAS. Each one of the uh, detectors is the size of a, cath a cathedral, and it's 100 meters underground. You, you have a human being here for reference. This is ATLAS, one of the two big experiments at CERN. And um, uh, ATLAS and CMS are the two biggest ones, uh, and they could maybe see in the future signs of dark matter. How would that be? It would probably look like the way neutrinos were discovered. You, you look at the uh, outcoming particles from a collision and, uh, and you account for their energies. You see what you brought in in terms of energy in the collision. And if it doesn't match, if there's some missing energy, that could be a sign for dark matter. Now, some uh, introductory words about White Rabbit, also for context for later. Uh, with White Rabbit, we wanted to design something that was very general, that was a, a network, a data network, because we do not only synchronization, but we use the synchronization in controls and data acquisition. So we also need a means to distribute messages. And when we started the White Rabbit project, there was no doubt for us, and still no doubt today, that the best networking technology, if you want to be sure that it will is still exist in 30 years, it's Ethernet. Uh, there is a, a, a number of problems with Ethernet to be used with syn for synchronization at the level we wanted. Ha White Rabbit was meant to do sub-nanosecond accuracy time transfer over 10, 15 kilometers of fiber. Since then, it has become much better, but that was the original aim. Uh, so first of all, uh, a White Rabbit network is made of a cascade of switches and nodes, and, and time flows downwards in this figure. So this switch disciplines this switch, which disciplines this switch, and a node gets disciplined by the switch that feeds it. Uh, and the obvious First problem is that in standard networking gear, uh, the oscillators are independent, and there's no two oscillators in nature that beat at the same frequency. So that was an obvious first problem to be overcome. And the way we uh, chose to fix that is to uh, have a white rabbit switch extract the clock signal from one of its ports. You know, each port has a clock and data recovery circuit. In Ethernet, you have the data stream coming, and then the clock and data recovery circuit gives you the clock and the data extracted from the data stream. So uh, one can use in the switch the clock extracted from the stream and then use it as a system clock to clock all the downstream ports uh, and in such a way propagate this common notion of frequency. So with that trick, which was nothing new, uh, the synchronous Ethernet already does that, um, we get 125 megahertz in our case everywhere. And then we're left with a phase problem. So everybody's beating at the same frequency, um, but uh, they have different phases. So in a white rabbit network, uh, the master, the grandmaster switch needs to be fed with an external source of uh, frequency, which should be high quality. Uh, and we will see later why that's important. So it should be as perfect as possible, a copy of itself n cycles ago, okay? Um, as I said, when you use this trick of extracting the clock signal from the uh, data stream, you end up with uh, the same frequency in terms of clock, but with a phase difference, which is uh, basically the result of this fiber link between those two, two switches. And that phase difference is made of an integer number of ticks plus a fractional pulse. So then we looked at uh, oh, and by the way, these changes with temperature are another external factor. So there's something that has to be done with it, uh, about it. We need to continuously monitor the length of these links so that we can compensate for that. So we looked again in the Ethernet world, what is the standard way of dealing with this type of measurements, this type of evaluation of fiber links, lengths, lengths. Uh, and there's a standard called PTP, IEEE 1588, which does it. Uh, and we, we used ideas from that standard and then we improved it and then we standardized White Rabbit within that standard. So it goes like this. Uh, time is going to flow downward in this animation. This is the master who knows time and this is the slave switch which, which is going to be disciplined. 
uh, at time t1 in the master time, uh, the master sends a frame to the slave switch, which <coughs> receives it and timestamps it t2 in its own time. Then at time t3 in the slave's uh, time, the slave sends a message back, uh, which is timestamped t4 in the master time. And once you have these uh, four timestamps, of course, this timestamp t4 is made available to the slave, so it has the four numbers. Uh, the time it took, the complete time it took for all these was t4 minus t1. If you subtract t3 minus t2, which is the dead time here, and make the assumption that the two-way delay is twice the one-way delay, you can make yourself an idea of what uh, the delay induced by the fiber is, which is this formula I, I just described. And then uh, the white rabbit uh, switch, the slave switch, uses that information to phase shift its clock so that rising edges align. And uh, uh, what we do is a phase delay to mimic a phase advance sometimes. So that's why it's important that the signal looks at itself a few cycles ago because we cannot fight physics, of course. Uh, so if you do that for every single link in a white rabbit network, you end up with everybody sharing the same common notion of time to within less than a nanosecond. And on top of that, this is all happening at the physical layer. On top of that, you have a full ethernet network, one gigabit bit per second to do your controls and data acquisition. This you get for free with uh, very little traffic. Now, we were developing this at CERN. Uh, White Rabbit was in a prototyping stage and then follow something unexpected happened. Uh, we uh, were also mm, working on the CERN Neutrinos to Grand Sasso project. For those of you who know quantum mechanics, a bit of quantum mechanics, Neutrinos are a mix of mass eigenstates which travel at different speeds. So a muon type of neutrino uh, can look like a tau neutrino a few kilometers down the line and then muon again, then tau again. And um, it is proven that if neutrinos oscillate, that automatically means they have mass. So it was a big deal at the time to detect, detect neutrino oscillations. So uh, we had a collaboration with the Gran Sasso National Lab in Italy whereby CERN sent a beam of neutrinos through the crust of the Earth, uh, 732 kilometers in a straight line, which were detected in Gran Sasso National Lab. Okay. From, uh, and neutrinos can do this because they don't interact electromagnetically, they don't barely interact gravitationally, they barely, uh, they don't interact uh, through the nuclear strong force, only nuclear, nuclear weak force. Okay. From the CERN side, it looked like this. Uh, this is the STS, which is the second biggest accelerator at CERN. It had an extraction line, protons hit a target, and out of that target, many particles came out, pions, kaons, but after a few meters of soil, only neutrinos survived, so you have a beam going straight to Gran Sasso. And in the Gran Sasso side, it's actually an exit inside, uh, in, uh, in the highway, inside a tunnel. So, uh, and then you have these caverns, which are and the idea is to, sh to use the, the mountains above to shield these detectors to provide a very quiet environment so that you're not perturbed by charged particles coming from cosmic rays. You can still have neutrinos that go happily through this mountain uh, from the sun, for example. And then what we were asked in terms of timing is to provide a timing system that would be able to discriminate statistically uh, between neutrino detections that were a result of neutrinos coming from CERN and neutrino detections that were a result of, of neutrinos coming from the sun. So the specifications were roughly in the one microsecond because it can happen once, but then twice, three times. So at the end, um, statistically, you can be reasonably sure and claim a discovery. Now the time transfer was done in a fairly standard way um, by um, using a standard GPS-based time transfer uh, for which we got help by METAS, PTV, ROA, based on ideas uh, by Pascal uh, Defren and uh, collaborators, uh, and that worked very well. And then, of course, from the GPS receiver locations, you have to take the signal to the extraction point at CERN, and you have to take the signal from the GPS receiver location in Gran Sasso to the detector. This was an eight kilometer fiber link in the case of Gran Sasso, four kilometer fiber link in the case of CERN. Um, so the system did its job in terms of um, discriminating between Sun and uh, certain neutrinos, but the stated accuracy actually was good enough to also make a raw speed measurement of the neutrinos. And everybody was very excited, surprised, stressed when the Opera Collaboration published a paper saying that uh, they had measured neutrinos traveling faster than the speed of light in vacuum, which of course is uh, in contradiction with special relativity. So um, 
uh, we were in the prototyping stages of iPubbit at the time, and we were asked to uh, double the local timing distribution at CERN and in Grand Sasso with White Rabbit links. While we were preparing for that, the Opera collaboration found that they had a couple of mistakes in their timing system, so it became more and more apparent to everybody that uh, neutrinos would not travel faster than the speed of light. And indeed, when we made the second round of measurements with White Rabbit in parallel, not only for Opera, but for the other three experiments in Grand Sasso as well, uh, we confirmed that neutrinos don't travel faster than the speed of light. So that was the first use, operational use of White Rabbit, quite a, quite a journey. Then we were very soon joined by the Cosmic Ray people and Gamma Ray community. It's the same community, actually. Cosmic rays are these very highly energetic particles that hit the atmosphere. Some of them tend to the 20 electron volts, which is more than a million times what we can do in the LHC. And uh, people looking for new physics, they want to look at places in the universe that provoke these, um, that, that, that produce these highly energetic particles to see exotic physics there. And it could be that uh, there could be dark matter candidates there as well, because some of the decay modes of dark matter give high energy particles. And if you point your instrument at a place where you know you're receiving cosmic rays from, and you don't see any light, that could be a candidate. Uh, gamma rays are these very highly energetic photons, uh, which um, very often people, more and more these days, uh, uh, use to participate in multi-messenger astrophysics campaigns, which consists of getting as much information as possible from a celestial object. Uh, this is just the photons case, so you can look at a, an object like the Crab Nebula, which is a remnant of a, a supernova explosion uh, which happened in the 11th century in, uh, in the constellation of Taurus. And you see that you, you see very different details depending on which wavelength you use to detect the light coming from this object. In terms of uh, cosmic ray detection, uh, the way it works is that these particles will hit the atmosphere and they will create a shower of particles. And if some of those result resulting particles are charged particles which travel faster than the speed of light in the medium, that means in the air, that's not forbidden by relativity, then a special kind of light is produced. It's called Cherenkov light. It goes out in a cone and it can be detected by light detectors on the ground. And um, these light detectors can be networked and synchronized to one with one another so that they behave as a huge detector which it would be impractical to build. And this is a very common theme in physics. Detectors made of subdetectors which are synchronized with one another because it would be impossible to build such a huge detector, okay? So this is a case in the Tunka Valley in Siberia. Um, here you can see the impact, which is quite direct, of course, between the jitter in the timing distribution to all these subdetectors and their ability to point precisely at a given object uh, as the origin of the cosmic ray shower. Uh, our friends in the Tunka collaboration also uh, brought a couple of tricks in the White Rabbit community. This is a very, very cheap and simple time to digital converter for time stamping. This is the output of their light detector. So implementing a simple threshold, uh, they turn this into a digital signal and then they fool the, an FPGA into thinking that this is a one gigabit per second data stream. So the deserializer uh, of the service module in the FPGA does a lot of work for you. It provides parallel words, and if you look at the place in the parallel word where, bi where bit flip, where bit flip, bit flip between zero and one, you have a one nanosecond resolution CDC in a very cheap way. Then one day in 2015, they had a, a, a funny encounter. There was physically two timing, two timing experiments meeting each other. Okay, so on the one hand, you have NASA, uh, which had embarked on the ISS, uh, an experiment to measure the atmosphere. And the way they did this was by shining pulses of laser light towards uh, the surface of the Earth and looking at backscattered light reflection, reflections and analyzing those to study things like clouds and aerosol with a goal of studying things like climate change, okay? And then one day, this thing was flying above Siberia. And you remember we have these um, detectors looking at the sky for Cherenkov light from cosmic rays. And, uh, and the ISS went by and shone light, which was detected by the cosmic ray detectors. So this is what they detected here. Uh, the red dot and the black dot, uh, the, the lower part is a zoom of the higher part. The higher part is the whole sky. 
the lower part is a zoom of the interesting area. This happened in 2015 and also in 2016. The red dot and the black dots are the advertised positions of the ISS and of the experiment inside the ISS. And the magenta dots that you will see appearing are the detections from the Cherenkov light detector. And you see that there's a fairly good agreement and uh, uh, they had some interesting discussions after this event for the alignment or the calibration of the detectors and also for the advertised positions of uh, the ISS and the experiment inside. So uh, then we were joined also by, by people from the neutrino community. It's a, it's a related type of um, community to the cosmic rays and gamma rays. They're also looking for high energy neutrinos. These are not the type of neutrinos I was speaking about that came from CERN to Gran Sasso. These are very high energy neutrinos coming from places in the universe which are very violent, wh in which interesting physics might be happening, okay? And uh, the uh, challenge with neutrinos is that they interact very weakly. Uh, so you need a huge volume to maximize your chances of detecting one. Uh, and you need a very quiet place. Uh, so Antarctica is a good candidate. Uh, here's the control room of the Ice Cube collaboration. Uh, it's, a, it's above the surface of the ice. And then below the surface of the ice, they have a uh, very deep well that they dig with hot water, injecting hot water in the, in the ice, going down to 3,000 meters. This is the Eiffel Tower for reference. And every 17 meters or so, they have a detector module. And they are all synchronized uh, in a way that when a particle, a high energy neutrino comes and it impinges a, a uh, a particle in the ice, you will also have Cherenkov light that you can detect. It's the same principle as the, in the case of the um, cosmic rays. Here's uh, somebody preparing one of these detector modules. They are extreme, they have extreme uh, conditions in terms of temperature, in terms of pressure. So uh, they, they have um, a lot of uh, time and energy invested in robustness of the electronics. And this is an artist depiction of what it looks like under the surface of the ice and a little animation about what happens when a high energy neutrino uh, arrives. You can see it from the upper left co corner, hits a particle, creates Cherenkov light, and the Cherenkov light shines and uh, uh, is detected by many different subdetectors, which are all synchronized in a way that you can trace back the incoming direction of the original high energy neutrino. In terms of timing for neutrino experiments, the upgrade of Ice Cube will use white rabbit with fibers from the central lab to the surface of each one of these strings going down. And then uh, for reason of mechan uh, me mechanical robustness, uh, they will use a copper-based system because they could not ensure that the huge pressure uh, when the ice freezes again, uh, uh, th that was not good for the connectors, for the optical connectors. So they are, they are using copper cables for that. Then there is a very similar and newer uh, experiment taking shape in the Mediterranean called KMP net and uh, it's the same principle but under the water of the sea also several thousand meters deep and uh, they will have clearer conditions ice is a, a bit milky the, the water will be more clear for KMP net uh, they modify the switch because the open license allows for it and uh, to avoid putting switches in the water and uh, uh, they contributed something very interesting for us which is the absolute calibration of nodes so in order to tell you what that is about, here's a model of uh, what we use. Of course, White Rabbit uses PTP, T1, T2, T3, T4, but before using that simple math, you have to take out the fixed delays in the uh, electronics. So going from the place where things are timestamped to the optical uh, boundary. And then we also have to account for the fact that we use a single fiber with two wavelengths. This is a new, one of the ethernet standards. Uh, and of course fiber is dispersive, so we have a parameter, which in our case was uh, constant, uh, although in, in, in practice it isn't, and we will see later how it isn't. Uh, but for the length of links and the temperature spans at CERN, it was okay for it to be a constant, which is the ratio of the speeds uh, between one wavelength and the other. We, we call this alpha. And our friends from NICEP uh, worked out a way to do absolute calibration. So in our calibration, standard calibration we do is relative, so this transmission time is always summed with this reception time in the, on the other side. They always appear together in sums, and that's fine by us when we want to do a relative calibration, but it would be very convenient if we could purchase white rabbit nodes off the shelf which are absolute ca absolutely calibrated. So if we have a number for this, 
a number for this. And it is tricky, of course, because it's electrical to optical. So our friends in, in the Netherlands have found a way uh, to, to measure those. And then people from metrology appeared and joined us. And this was very fun because, of course, you guys are very picky. And um, uh, there were all sorts of things that were improved uh, thanks to the metrology community. I will just uh, illustrate one of them. Uh, as I told you, uh, in a white rabbit link, the slave receives a clock from the clock and data recovery circuit, extracts a clock and uses it for any downstream communications, but also to encode data back to the master in such a way that the master finds itself with a delayed copy of its own clock at the same frequency, but just delayed. Okay, uh, and what we do is we use a phase detector to detect the phase difference, and then with that phase measurement, we enhance T1, T2, T3, T4, these timestamps of frames, okay? And that's why using the simple math of PTP, we can get some nanosecond accuracy. And the circuit we use to uh, do phase measurements, uh, it's, uh, it's very clever. It's uh, an evolution of uh, an analog circuit from the 70s uh, in which these flip-flops were mixers. But basically, it's the same idea. If we want to uh, compare two 125 megahertz signals, we build ourselves an auxiliary uh, uh, frequency like 124.999 megahertz, very close in frequency to the one we're trying to measure phases of. of uh, so if there is a, uh, a 125 and a 124.999 here sweeping it with this flip-flop, at the output of the flip-flop, you have a low frequency waveform. It sweeps very, very slowly. There are some glitches. You de-glitch them with the circuit here. And then what was a tiny uh, time difference in the input becomes a much bigger time difference in the output. There is this zooming effect uh, thanks to this vernier effect. Uh, and you can measure this at your leisure. And with this system, you can easily go into the picosecond uh, measurements without any problem. And what's really nice for us is that in the switch, we need 18 of these. Uh, because every port is doing this in, uh, all the time. So um, it's very cheap and very simple to replicate. Once you have this, this is good <coughs> for everybody. This can be shared. So adding more channels is just a few flip-flops. And it's fully digital, fully linear, so it's great. Except it is used, you don't need to understand this whole block diagram, but the DMTD, the phase detector, has many input channels in the white rabbit switch, and it is fed, when, when, when the switch is grandmaster, it receives an external 10 megahertz reference, which is multiplied up by an internal PLN in an FPGA, which has some nasty uh, bump in uh, phase noise at 100 kilohertz. And the problem is that this phase detector, the DMTD, is a digital phase detector. It gives you a sample, samples at a rate of three kilohertz. So this whole system is a discrete time system. So this thing is being sampled and uh, it is uh, being, uh, how do you say, aliased uh, into baseband at a place which you cannot, where you cannot get rid of it because white rabbit is nothing else than a huge cascade of PLLs. So low frequency phase noise is there to stay, so it's a big problem. So one of my colleagues designed an improvement for the switch in which the, this internal PLL is not used anymore and there's an external add-on board that takes care of this multiplication. And these are the new performances of the switches, both in grandmaster mode and in uh, boundary clock mode, uh, uh, compared with the old version without the improvements. And the same thing in Allen deviation. So you have in uh, red and blue, the new versions of the switch. Okay, so let me finish uh, this journey through physics with uh, Another way of looking at the sky, which is uh, radio astronomy, so much lower frequencies. Uh, why do people look do that? Uh, very often to look farther away because the uh, wavelengths uh, are bigger and the attenuation of the light is smaller. Uh, visible light gets easily uh, deflected, stopped, attenuated by interstellar dust. So here's an example of a galaxy, I think uh, like 200 million light years away. And, and you, you see that you see much more detail. This is the same scale looking at lower frequencies. And in particular, people use a lot the 21 centimeter line of um, neutral hydrogen. This is related to dark ener energy searches because uh, in the case of dark energy, I think people are st still trying to gather data for the evidence of its effect. Of course, there is an effort to explain what it is as well, but 
Um, there's also a big effort to just see what its effects are. So you have to look at very distant objects to measure the effects. And this is what they intend to do in the square kilometer array, which is a big collaboration or where, where you will have an array of radio telescopes. Uh, there will be two sites, one in South Africa and one in uh, Australia. And uh, the same idea applies. So this recurrent pattern of uh, having many telescopes synchronized with one another and making it behave like a bigger telescope because the pointing resolution depends on the ratio between wavelength and the dish, the effective dish diameter. So you mimic a bigger dish by uh, taking coherent uh, samples in each one of these dishes and combining them in a correlator. So in terms of uh, uh, geographical distribution, this is the story for uh, SKA in South Africa. They have a site with a control room uh, between 100 and 200 kilometers away from where uh, the, the telescopes are in a very, very secluded and very uh, quiet area in the desert. And the problem for time distribution is that the fibers, they share the same infrastructure as the uh, electrical power distribution poles. They are not buried, so they are exposed to huge excursions in terms of temperature. Uh, they have their own dedicated system, a fully optical system for the down mixing of the signals in the dishes and the sampling. Uh, at the time they uh, expressed their requirements, White Rabbit was not up to this. Uh, they, this is a variation of uh, one of the uh, many designs for uh, uh, phase compensated uh, microwave distribution. Um, it, it guarantees a constant phase uh, but it doesn't have any notion, it's modulo 2 pi, it doesn't have any notion of how many cycles. Okay? So you also need a, some kind, something that's really relatable to UTC and they use White Rabbit for that. Um, for for uh, time stamping their acquisitions, also for observing things like pulsars, for phasing in of these other uh, more accurate systems. Uh, and they noticed that uh, there were some shortcomings when you use White Rabbit for longer distances and bigger temperature ranges. Uh, we were using uh, SFP transceivers in the switch, which are Ethernet standard. Their separation, I think, is the two, it's a it's single fiber, but the TX and the RX wavelength are quite separated. I think it's 1310 and 1490 nanometers. And our assumption that the ratio of speeds between those two wavelengths in a fiber is constant uh, does not hold if these wavelengths are very much separated. So they noticed that and they replaced the SFP modules, the optical modules by DWDM modules in which they chose to separate just by one channel to have a bit of margin to make sure that it didn't, uh, it wasn't any, there wasn't any interference and they got much better uh, results. So this is a, a plot of the temperature variations that they experienced. This is the round trip delay following these variations and if you do nothing about it, this is in the order of 100 nanoseconds easily. And when they fixed the, uh, the problem by replacing the SFP modules by these SFPs with a much smaller separation in terms of TX and RX wavelength. This is the result for a 64 kilometer link and they say we're within uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.2 uh, nanoseconds. Okay, and I cannot finish this talk without showing this picture uh, of this wonderful event that happened last week. Um, it has nothing to do with white rabbit. These people, people who uh, made the first image of a black hole, they don't need to uh, synchronize their timing systems in real time. They can do things after the fact, but timing still plays uh, a big role in, in, the, in this endeavor because they have hydrogen masers and with the, without the stability of the masers, they could not do the type of correlation they do to, uh, to observe this object, which is more than 50 million years away, 50 million light years away. So they uh, observe at, at a wavelength of 1.3 millimeters. Again, for the reasons we invoked earlier, uh, bigger wavelengths mean that you can look farther away. And I think we're really fortunate, we're really privileged in the timing community to, uh, to play such a key role uh, for, for helping these scientists uh, who are changing the, the history of physics. So with this, I would like to finish my talk and I will take uh, any questions you have. Thanks.
Yes. Uh, there is not a lot of margin, actually, to do better. White Rabbit was always thought to be something which is off the shelf, something that you can easily, sorry, I have a lot of extra slides. Uh, I'm looking for one about a study somebody did about the limitations of White Rabbit. Okay, so these are the limits of the phase detector um, inside the FPGA. And my colleague, Mattia Rizzi, did two experiments. One about, uh, one taking uh, one splitter just outside of the FPGA and feeding it to two different pins of the FPGA. Uh, and then measuring phase, <coughs> taking time tags uh, with the phase and uh, doing the PSD of that. And this is the results. And then he did the same thing, but splitting inside the FPGA. Okay, so uh, splitting inside and then feeding to two different phase detectors inside the FPGA and the result is this. So you see already that the input-output blocks of the FPGA contribute quite a lot of uh, low-frequency noise. Uh, so that will be hard to fight because uh, White Rabbit is this thing that you can do with uh, cheap <coughs> electronics and uh, lots of clever ideas, right? Um, but we do, we are based on an FPGA. Uh, the good news is that the new families, which we were fearing that because of feature sizes which are smaller would be worse, they're not so much worse. Uh, so in terms of, this is the limit of, uh, of the phase detector. Any changes from that, using that phase detector would be quite a radical change. And uh, people might have ideas, and in fact, um, if people have ideas, I mean, some people I know have ideas about how to overcome this. This is a good moment because we're starting to work on, on the next version of the White Rabbit switch. So um, we will take all the things we have learned, including the fix Mattia Rizzi did for the current uh, switch. Um, we will take these fundamental limits into account to see if we want to stay with this kind of technology or we want to do something a bit outside of the FPGA. That would also be something possible. But again, uh, White Rabbit is, uh, I, I know it's tempting because we're kind of at the limit of what uh, people, you know, people could potentially use White Rabbit to transfer masers. So it is tempting, we're qu quite close to that. So we have a tough decision to make if we want to, um, to stay with this kind of technology or do something a bit uh, outside the FPGA, which I, I, I think this shows a fundamental limitation of the FPGA. Okay, uh, I don't know if there's a, a navigator here that I could use, but basically there are designs out there which are much cheaper than the switch and that uh, you could use as a basis for um, developing uh, White Rabbit gear. There's, for example, an FMC mezzanine with two ports that is very, very cheap. The switch itself cannot be super expensive because it's open hardware. So there are already four companies building it and that means that if one of them goes crazy with the price, very naturally people will not buy from that company. Uh, companies are currently making business by adding value to White Rabbit in the periphery of the project with proprietary developments, which is, a, I think, is a business model that works. They don't, I don't think they have a lot of margin on the switch. Uh, so, uh, yes, if price is an issue uh, of, for the switch, then it's a fundamental problem because, again, it's, uh, I don't think they can go much lower in price. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Yes. We would need to look at who are the main which are the main contributors to the cost in the switch. Uh, and I think it's the FPGA. So less powerful FPGA, that could be one option, yes. And I think depending on the number of units, uh, one of the companies could find it um, worthy to, uh, to, uh, to do a white rabbit switch, which is less capable, less number of ports, and uh, I don't know. The, uh, the accuracy, I think it comes a bit for free. Uh, the, uh, what I told you is, you know, the phase detector is very simple. Uh, um, gigabit Ethernet transceivers do a lot of the heavy lifting for you because uh, a gigabit clock and data recovery circuit um, 
has to be quite precise, uh, otherwise the data link is compromised. So we are capitalizing on, uh, on a lot of engineering effort from the transceivers inside the FPGA, and what you get is already very good. So I think, um, yeah, one, one way I could see to cut costs is less number of ports, but less accuracy, I think, would not save you that much money. Yes? It's also a two-way. It's also a two-way scheme, but uh, I, I think it's not a duplex one. I think they send a signal, and then they wait. And so there's a. I, I'm not fully sure, but I think there's a, a. The emitter on the on the surface sends a pulse, and then there's a bit of silence, and then the receiver from down in the eyes sends a pulse back, and they um, their their the drift of the oscillator doesn't go very far because it's quite immediate. Uh, I think it's a, it's a two-way scheme, uh, a poor man's two-way scheme, which is good enough for their purposes. And uh, the main reason they do it is because it's um, mechanically, they didn't find a way uh, to withstand the huge pressures when the water solidifies again after drilling to access. Yeah. Yes. Yes, you need to ensure symmetry, which in this case is, in my opinion, well ensured. Because you know, when, when you have twisted pairs, and this is something we discovered in our investigation, uh, an Ethernet cable, for example, with twisted pairs, very often the different twisted pairs, they have different twisting ratios to avoid uh, crosstalk between them. Uh, so in the end, you cannot assume that one twisted pair inside a cable is the same length as the other twisted pair. But I think in this case, there's, they're using the very same twisted pair in simplex. Uh, in simplex, uh, in, in, in non-duplex non uh, configuration. So I think their, their symmetry assumption is, is quite good, and I guess they have tested this, so, yeah. Very good, thank you. Mm -hmm. So our next speaker, so next uh, speaker is um, 